Hello, welcome to our webinar today, Tennessee Succeeds, Applying the ESSA Requirements to Tennessee. We're joined this afternoon by Eve Carney, who is the Executive Director of Consolidated Planning and Monitoring for the Department of Education. In that role, she oversees federal programs in ePlan, which is a platform through which districts share with the state how they are planning to spend their funding. Perhaps most importantly for this discussion, Eve is leading the team that is crafting and writing the ESSA state plan, which outlines how the state will address the requirements of the new federal education law. She's going to walk through what the department has done so far leading up to the release of the draft ESSA plan last month and outline how the state has proposed to address some of the big requirements in ESSA. She and the team at the department also want to hear your thoughts and questions. Please write your comments or questions in the questions box on your screen as folks from the department will be monitoring that questions box. Any questions that they cannot get to, they will follow up with you later. So I will change the presenter now to Eve Carney. Thank you so much and thank you all for joining us this afternoon to learn more about Tennessee Succeeds and how Tennessee plans to move forward uh, with the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act. Uh, we are excited to share this information with teachers across the state. Uh, our uh, agenda for today would include the following. Uh, we're going to give some updates on where we are in the process and identify the five opportunities that we see that the Every Student Succeeds Act offers for Tennessee. We're going to pause at that moment for questions or for you to insert your comments uh, in the questions box. Uh, then we will move into an overview of the school accountability model that is part of the Every Student Su Succeeds Act, but also part of uh, what our state has passed in the A through F school grading. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act was passed on December the 10th, 2015, and states were given a period of time in which to develop plans to comply with this law that is replacing No Child Left Behind. And as we began to think about how we wanted to approach this work, we uh, believed that the work that we had begun with a very specific vision for our districts and schools that it for Tennessee was best to align those things so that we could demonstrate how the Every Student Succeeds Act supported Tennessee in our state-specific plan. And the, the vision that you see on your screen is one that you will see reflected in our plan as it speaks to excellence and equity for all students, uh, equipping them for choice after graduation. And so what you will see as we move through the draft and the opportunities within the draft, you will see uh, items and strategies that align to uh, that vision that is aligned with our plan. And it is aligned around the goals that you see. And these are the big goals uh, that we at the state level are driving. And if we are to meet uh, Governor Haslam's goals around Drive to 55, what we have in Tennessee Promise and through our Hope Scholarship, opportunities. These are the goals that we continue to uh, that continue to drive our work. And the first is around ranking in the top half of states on the national on the national report card by 2019. And just quickly where we are, uh, we are making great progress uh, toward that goal, ranking uh, in the top actually 25th in fourth grade math making some gains in fourth and eighth grade science by ranking 19th and 21st respectively there. Uh, making some gains in eighth grade math, but know that reading is still a great challenge as you will see in the second goal, which is around early grades reading, 75% of third graders being proficient in reading by 2025. And much of what the department is working to uh, support districts in doing is reaching that goal, knowing that strong literacy skills truly, even in the early grades, uh, unlock opportunities later in a child's education. The third goal around the average ACT composite in Tennessee will be a 21 by 2020. We are seeing gains here, ranking last year in the, as a, at the 19.4 level. Uh, as we began to 
develop this plan, there were conversations about why are we only considering the last score rather than the best score? And when considering, you know, the best or the highest score for graduates, you know, we're moving that up around a, a 19.9. So again, this is one that moves a little more slowly, but one that Tennessee is definitely uh, moving toward the, the goal of 21. The last one around the majority of high school graduates from the class of 2020 earning a post-secondary certificate, diploma, or degree. Uh, currently, Tennessee has a, an extremely high graduation rate at 88.5, and we're seeing uh, Tennessee's college going rate increasing by 5%. So we, we know that when we, when we focus uh, specifically on key goals, we will see movement, and we have, we have begun that trajectory to meet those goals and all of the goals you see here. And so as we drafted our plan for ESSA, uh, to comply with the federal law, but also to support the continued work around our strategic plan. It is organized around the strategic priorities you see on your screen that align with those goals that we just discussed. Early foundations in literacy, high school bridge to post-secondary, all means all, educator support, and district empowerment, which really is around, it is a, it is a priority that kind of undergirds the others and provides uh, districts with the tools and the uh, flexibilities, autonomies needed to make decisions that are best for their students and their circumstances. So this is the way in which we have organized our plan uh, for the Every Student Succeeds Act. So we will move into that now and again I will move through this relatively quickly. It's an extensive comprehensive plan and and I don't know that there is time to go through it uh, at a very granular level, but it is absolutely one that is out there available for public comment and for review uh, in its totality at 305 pages, I believe. So we will move to that now. When we started this work, it really was around kind of what is our, what is our end game? What is our ultimate goal? here and it really was about letting Tennessee be the driver of this plan and our priorities and our goals leading uh, the development of this plan and we wanted it uh, we it was very important to the department to engage stakeholders not just at the beginning but throughout the process and even throughout the implementation so as we move into the spring of this year with our submission, and I'll go through that timeline briefly in a moment, we expect the engagement to continue because once this plan is submitted to the feds and approved uh, by summer, uh, that's not the end. We know that education, if we look back even over five, ten years, how much education has changed both in Tennessee and nationally. We know that our needs will change, and this is a plan that we expect to be fluid uh, and to be able to grow with us and with our state as we move forward. Here is the timeline that under which we've been working uh, beginning you know, last May with the commissioner kicking off uh, in regional meetings with superintendents of schools, moving through a stakeholder input phase, drafting uh, and, and making public that first draft and seeking feedback and that is where that is the phase in which we are in now and we last night actually uh, finished our fifth town hall meeting across the state uh, to really hear from from what questions remain and what are the concerns and where are there are areas where we need to do a better job explaining our plan and that is what we will continue to do through the month of January before the submission of our plan in March by April of this year. So here's another kind of look at that timeline and where we are. At the end of this month we will present our plan to the State Board of Education and engage with in consultation with the Governor's Office and the Legislature as required by ESSA uh, in that process. We expect to continue to pull feedback from uh, webinars such as this town hall meetings, website, we have an email set up, we'll share that with you. Uh, it's essa.feedback, E-S-S-A dot feedback at tn.gov, as well as the online feedback form. Uh, we also have received uh, feedback at all of the town hall meetings, and all of this will be pulled together and to inform the edits that we are making in this, this uh, period of our plan development. Uh, we will submit our plan at the uh, 
beginning of April of this year, the U.S. Department of Education uh, has indicated that they need about three months to, in which to approve these plans. So our goal is to have our plan approved as we move into a new uh, federal fiscal year in the summer uh, and for the 17-18 school year. As we drafted our plan, we really did identify five, uh, what we see as five key opportunities. Uh, ESSA is, a, is not perfect, but it does offer new opportunities that we haven't had uh, previously under No Child Left Behind. If I had to characterize it, I think about it around equity, around support for all students, and really thinking about that well-rounded student and the components that it takes sometimes to support students, of course academically, but some of those additional supports that students need to be successful in the classroom. So again, new opportunities in ESSA, and, and these are the five that we will go through now, and they're listed here around high expectations, uh, attending to the needs of all students, continuing to provide support for those persistently low-performing schools, uh, focusing on and strengthening support for educators, mm -hmm. and how best to empower districts uh, in that work. Because it is our belief at the State Department that our work is to empower district to make those decisions. And the closer those decisions are made to students, the more informed they are and most often most effective. So opportunity one, this is really around the, you know, continuing to set high expectations uh, for students that are aligned uh, to post-secondary and workforce readiness, preparing students for choice after graduation. I've heard our commissioner say that really the high school diploma should, should be a ticket to lots of opportunities for students to pursue uh, their interests, whether that's uh, going to a four-year institution, a, a TCAT, or other um, going into work through one of the CTE credentialed programs. And it is through the um, setting of very uh, rigorous state-specific standards in math, ELA, science, and social studies, uh, through a comprehensive review process every six years where we bring in teachers and other stakeholders to work uh, on those standards uh, that then are aligned to our assessments. Uh, we continue at the department to, to identify opportunities to reduce testing time as we did uh, when we last year in reducing the amount of testing by 30 percent by removing part two of the math assessment but also thinking about are there other areas where we could potentially reduce testing uh, in the lower grades for uh, maybe potentially third and fourth grade students. Those aren't things that we take lightly and we are continuing to uh, look for those opportunities and ensure that the fidelity of our assessment program is not uh, impacted by making those types of reductions. Out there on the website now are new score reports that really provide uh, user-friendly information for families uh, around uh, assessment information and one that we also are excited to continue that process to make that that information more accessible, more meaningful uh, for uh, those who support students, both teachers and families. The ACT retake opportunity, uh, and a really exciting opportunity for seniors to have that uh, ability to retake at no cost, the ACT. What we know is that most students perform uh, better having that additional opportunity. Uh, and so thus far, over 24,000 students across Tennessee have taken advantage of that, as well as offering an ACT prep course uh, for districts across the state. Opportunity two is, is really about what I just discussed, attending to the needs of all students, uh, especially uh, those who are historically disadvantaged, so that they have what they need to be successful after graduation. And that is around that well-rounded concept that is, that is very key in ESSA. And that comes both with expanded uses of federal dollars under Title I, but also a new Title IV grant called Student Support and Academic Enrichment, which is new federal money for all districts across Tennessee to support well-rounded educational opportunities, safe and healthy uh, students through whether that's uh, mental health services, counseling, parent involvement, 
prevention of dropout, uh, it could be safety related, um, or other supports needed to provide a safe learning environment, as well as building uh, the uh, infrastructure for uh, technology and other uh, capacities uh, in the classrooms. So it's a new opportunity there that really supports this, this opportunity around well-rounded education. Beyond that, it is about expanding coursework and elective offerings. I mentioned earlier equity. We always think about equity. We may have a preconceived definition in our minds about what equity means, but SS sees equity as equity of opportunity as well as uh, around the access to highly effective teachers as well as funding opportunities. So it really is about opportunities for expanded courses as well as highly effective teachers. Uh, a very big focus in ESSA is around uh, human capital and how districts are ensuring that the highly effective teachers are serving in the schools where they're needed most. Improved accountability in the uh, framework. There are new indicators required in ESSA and around the, the previously Title III accountability was separate. Now it's part of the overall accountability model. And that's what you see there around uh, English language proficiency, or we're calling it the ELPA indicator, as well as these two additional opportunity to learn and measuring whether graduates are ready. And we, we, when we go through the opportunities and we, after we pause for questions, uh, we will dig into that school level accountability where you'll learn more information about those two indicators. Opportunity three continues the focus on those low performing, uh, persistently low performing schools. And this is really uh, around the state's role in identifying and supporting the 5% of the lowest performing schools in the state and providing those additional supports that are needed. And, and it's really about re-envisioning what are those supports how do they, how we as a state fund those schools, uh, but also knowing that what works in one district may not work in another district. Uh, and so providing districts with uh, the opportunity to turn around those schools first uh, with significant input and oversight by the department, uh, because these are schools that uh, have been on the list and have had issues uh, with performance for a number of years. And so uh, we are committed to serve those low-performing schools as we have historically through our school improvement grants, uh, which are, they look a little bit different in the Every Student Succeeds Act, but the requirement to serve the 5% lowest performing remains. Okay. Opportunity four is around focusing on and strengthening uh, and supporting educators. We see this as an opportunity uh, that is really clear in ESSA, and I mentioned it earlier about equity, but it is about improving those teacher pipelines and educator pipelines, partnering with higher ed through the higher ed report card and other initiatives to provide districts with more information about the preparation programs, but also how to widen that pipeline to attract new teachers to your area, as well as offering some competitive grant programs for teacher and principal and teacher residency programs, uh, we know that the more qualified teachers we have across the state serving our schools, uh, the issue of equity uh, becomes one that's that's you know one that you can manage. Uh, it becomes difficult when when your pipeline is not uh, sufficient to support your needs, and so part of that uh, is about the department's role in providing districts information through these human capital reports which districts have received that provide information on teacher uh, effectiveness as well as equity gaps both within districts and between districts as well as mobility rates. When, when a teacher leaves a district, uh, where do they go? Are they just retiring or are they moving to the nearby district or did they leave uh, for other opportunities? And that type of information is helpful for districts as they plan uh, their, their plan to support teachers throughout their career, not just once they're hired, but how do you retain them and how do you support them and provide them with quality professional development that's aligned to what they need. And part of what we have included in ESSA 
in the state plan for Tennessee are opportunities for innovation and whether that's uh, whether that's you know opportunities for competitive grants to do things differently as well as uh, personalized learning opportunities for teachers and students. The final opportunity is, is around the empowered districts strategic priority and this really is if, in my mind one that does undergird the others because it requires the department and charges the department with giving districts what they need to do the work that they are best equipped to do which is lead their schools and make those individualized decisions at the district and school levels that allows uh, students to be successful, teachers to be successful uh, and that happens through support from our core offices as well as opportunities for that personalized learning. I mentioned it for teachers ESSA also includes opportunities uh, and some innovation around personalized learning for students as well. Also uh, providing clearer information and a number of transparency metrics under the new accountability framework. So while we, you know, we've talked and we've met with stakeholders throughout this process and yes we've heard uh, lots of things that should or should not be part of our accountability model, but part of what we hope that this law will, will provide in addition to new opportunities, more flexibility, more decision-making authority for states and districts. It also provides information so that informed decisions both at the district level and for, with parents and other stakeholders within the community, a, a, a wealth of information to uh, inform those decisions. I'm going to pause right there and take some questions before we move into the School of Accountability section of the presentation. So we've gotten um, a couple questions so far. I'll, I'll ask a couple now and then we'll recircle back toward the end to make sure we get through um, all of our content. And, and I think a couple of these questions actually will be answered as we work through this. Um, we got a question about additional support, additional funding for increasing well-rounded um, education. We talked about a little bit in opportunity to. Can you talk a little bit about what Title IV does um, allow the new flexibility allows for school districts to use that funding to increase well-rounded Sure, education. absolutely. When they when they added this new Title IV Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grant to the Every Student Succeeds Act, it really was a great opportunity and a and a nice complement to what we know with Title I is pretty restricted to academic needs. But we all know as educators that it takes more uh, than that often to support students, and this is a grant that allows districts to make decisions and the use of funds around this Title IV grant is pretty broad. Uh, they've kind of categorized it in three kind of buckets. The first one being well-rounded educational opportunities and they list a host of things that could include just expanded course offerings. Maybe you want to add or your, your district no longer funds a music teacher or a, a, a certain elective that you've been interested in or uh, other STEM opportunities as well as it, AP, IB, uh, those types of uh, dual enrollment programs. It can be opportunities like that that for different reasons have not been funded as well as uh, opportunities for counseling and mental health and, and uh, guidance counselors and other opportunities uh, that really do uh, address the needs uh, of, of those wraparound support services. The other piece is around that they include is the effective use of technology and this is really not technology in isolation but how you use technology within the academic subjects to enhance uh, a student's education and so uh, it, it really is kind of in those three buckets but I will say it is quite broad uh, the, the takeaway is it needs to align with what a district is identifies in its uh, plan as an identified need of that district and so it is while a district it needs to be aligned and working you know, in concert with some of the other uh, programs, it is definitely an opportunity to add something that for different reasons uh, is currently not funded in a district. Great. And other question um, that well, I know we'll talk to you on a little bit in just a moment, but I uh, wanted to um, get a question about our vision statement and that we want to equip students for their chosen path in life. Uh -huh. And we mean that more than just college. We mean that for a, a broad set of things. I know we'll have, um, we have a ready graduate ind index that we're going to be adding, but would you want to talk a little bit about how we are thinking about this um, you know, support really students to be successful on a number of paths, whether that's the military, whether that's going to a sure. TCAT, anything like that? 
And I'm, I'm really glad. And I actually, I like that vision statement because I do think it's open to other paths. And I think it acknowledges that not every student is required to follow one path, but really an opportunity to prepare them for whatever that is. And whether that is military, uh, whether that's a vocational program, whether that's uh, a four-year institution, uh, a TCAT, other, it, it is really intended to to encompass a number of pathways for students after uh, high school. So I, I think it's intended to be open-ended because we know every student, we, we know students uh, learn differently, we know that they have different interests and skills and abilities and want to ensure that we are, the other piece of our vision that speaks to me is that it speaks about all students. And so I think having that type of uh, broad uh, definition is really helpful. Great. Great. Well, let's go back to the presentation and then okay. we'll take a few more questions. Great. So we're going to shift now into probably one of the biggest changes that the Every Student Succeeds Act brings not just to Tennessee but to uh, every state in the nation. <laughs> and that is really this shift to uh, a school level accountability model. Historically, Tennessee's model has been as a state agency, we support districts, we serve districts, and districts then uh, work with their schools. What ESSA requires is the uh, meaningfully differentiation of schools every year. So that has happened in the new law. Uh, coinciding with that, last year the General Assembly in the state of Tennessee passed uh, the summative A through F letter grade uh, and state that all schools will be awarded the summative letter grade. So rather than developing two competing systems, we decided that it would be best uh, for all of these pieces to come together uh, so that schools understand what their expectations are and the way in which this the uh, A through F and school accountability model will work. We're going to walk through it at a very high level. Uh, one of the things that was shared early on as we had a, I should back up for just a minute. As we began this process, we developed six working groups uh, with stakeholders across the state to dig into some of the key areas of the state plan. And uh, we had standards and assessment as one, accountability, English learners, educator support, school improvement, student support was the sixth one. And so we had folks from the department leading those teams. This school accountability working group that, that tackled this, uh, developed these guiding principles as to what really mattered uh, in the development of this system. And it was really about all schools should have the opportunity to achieve an A. And it was, some of you may know of other states who have an A through F grading system. I believe Tennessee is the 18th state to uh, have this model. But Tennessee's is very different. It is not the, the cookie cutter A through F that you may that may be out there for other states. And one of the driving guiding principles is that all schools should have an opportunity uh, to achieve an A. I won't sit here and tell you that it, it is an easy path, uh, but it is. it was important that poverty should not be destiny and that all schools should have that opportunity either through achievement or growth to, to really move schools, move their school and be awarded uh, for that growth and achievement. The second principle is really around all means all and that each indicator should ha be reported both of course for all students but also for those historically underserved student groups so that that information and that data are out there uh, and that it's important to be accountable for all students and that all growth should be award rewarded. Uh, we know that not everyone starts at the same space. And that moving, you know, moving high-performing schools is difficult. But moving a low-performing school that may be in the bottom quintile of schools is very challenging work. And so, knowing that all growth matters, and whether that's growth between um, uh, the lowest of levels or moving students from on track to mastered, uh, is equally important. The last piece is that reporting should be transparent, and that. There should be multiple points of data to review these indicators and, and uh, for people to, both district officials and parents to make informed decisions uh, about that. So when the intended, as the A through F grading system was developed, here was the, um, on your screen you'll see the actual outcomes that we intended from this. And that would be to create a model, uh, a, 
A through F model that uh, is comprised of both performance and progress. So that it wasn't just a letter grade based on one indicator, but one that really looked at both overall achievement or performance as well as progress. Uh, indicators that promote a positive school culture and readiness for life after graduation, as well as one that improved life trajectory for students. So really working to ensure that we are uh, focusing on the right uh, indicators that really can make a difference in the education of a child. And so what you see on your screen are the actual indicators uh, that are in Tennessee's model and it is a based on student achievement, student growth, progress toward English language proficiency, and one of the new requirements from ESSA is a measure of school quality and student success. And for Tennessee, we, uh, we decided on two indicators, and the first is the opportunity to learn indicator, the second being the ready graduate indicator. I will dig into those uh, in just a moment, but I wanted to see that it's, you know, when you think about assigning that letter grade to a school, uh, it should be based on a number of, of attributes, and these are the indicators uh, that are currently being proposed for Tennessee's uh, school accountability model. The first indicators, so we'll dig into each of those separately now. The first indicator is achievement, and it has two paths there. The first one is absolute proficiency, and this would be for uh, measuring the percentage of students who are uh, whose performance is on track for the subject areas that you see there, math, English language arts, science, and social studies. So a school could earn an A by ranking in the top fifth of, of schools or top 20% on overall uh, proficiency. So that's one path for this indicator. The second path is really about targets and meeting those annual me uh, measurable objectives, uh, which would be targets uh, for how you are improving the percentage of students who are on track. Now this is really the, that piece around uh, the growth piece that a school, even if they were not um, in the top 20 percent, if a school in a single year doubled its AMO target, they could indeed earn an A for the achievement indicator by doubling that AMO target. You know, I mentioned earlier that all schools have the ability to earn an A. I said it wasn't going to be easy and anyone, uh, as you know how hard it is to move students, uh, a school who not just meets its target but, you know, doubles its AMO target could, would absolutely earn an A and deservedly so. The second indicator is growth, and Tennessee will continue to use its TVOS system for uh, measuring growth. And this is about, you know, attempting to measure uh, the impact that that year of schooling has on an individual student uh, achievement. And again, this is the measure of individual student growth, where they begin and where they end. Uh, again, regardless of whether they are on track uh, or mastered, this is measuring uh, the level of growth that happens across a school year. So achievement was the first one with the two pathways. Growth is the second indicator uh, which would be measured by TVOS. The third ind indicator, and this is a change, this is not, this was one of the big changes in the Every Student Succeeds Act. English language proficiency used to be what we would call Title III accountability and uh, it is now part of the overall accountability model. I think this speaks to the department at the U.S. Department of Education's commitment to all students. Moving this and making it a key component or indicator of the overall accountability model is a way to shine a brighter light on a student group who historically uh, has been, you know, underserved, underperforming, and one that moving it into this model, it, we expect that it will that districts will approach it differently and it will be measured by the percent of uh, English learners reaching proficiency or earning pr sufficient progress on what we call the ELPA which is the English language proficiency assessment so again we had the achievement indicator the growth indicator the, the ELPA indicator here um, 
And the last one is this measure of school quality and student success. Again, brand new to ESSA. And when you think about trying to identify one indicator for school quality and student success, we found that very challenging to find that one perfect measure. And so we approach this uh, in a different way. And, that, and that's through actually two components, which would be the first one, the opportunity to learn indicator. And for the first year, Tennessee will use uh, chronic absenteeism um, as that measure. And it will be measured on either a low overall rate or a reduction in the rate of chronic absenteeism. And on the screen is the definition of chronically absent students. Uh, what we expect going forward is that we will continue to identify other potential measures here. I know um, there have been several items uh, including suspensions, ex expulsions, discipline, teacher attendance, other pieces that, uh, that really speak to a student's opportunity to learn. And so as we move forward in the Every Student Succeeds Act, we know you can have the most effective teacher in every classroom, and if the students aren't there, uh, then that, op that is an opportunity that is not there. So uh, thinking through uh, how districts may use that Title IV money we talked about earlier could be to support um, programs to encourage student attendance or to incentivize student attendance in that way to address this, should that be a need. But we do expect to continue to explore other uh, ways in which to measure opportunity to learn and we have received a great deal of feedback on what that should be uh, probably the area where there's maybe the most divergent opinions as well as to what that is and I think that always means it's 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 very difficult to think about some of those qualitative measures that aren't um, strictly uh, achievement or data driven that can can measure something that would be meaningful the second uh, measure of school quality and student success is the ready graduate indicator and it's really about um, those early post-secondary opportunities and you will see a, a graphic on your screen that speaks to the different early post-secondary opportunities and it's not just one thing, it's not just AP or I, international IB uh, but it's other opportunities including dual credit, dual enrollment, industry certification and the reason that this measure was identified is that you know we know that there is a positive correlation between students who successfully complete EPSOs um, having a better opportunity to score 21 on ACT as well as a, a correlation to student persistence uh, and better grades in college. So here is that indicator. So for high schools, it does look different for high schools and elementary, uh, K-8 and then high school because there are different pieces to that. So for high school, uh, this would be the graduation rate multiplied by the percentage of students uh, meeting, scoring 21 or higher on the ACT. And again, this is an or. So if, if you have students who score 21 or higher, they would be considered a ready graduate or they completed four early post-secondary opportunities. Again, a student who does that would also be deemed a ready graduate or completing two early post-secondary opportunities and earning the uh, correlated industry credential that goes along with that. And that's around those CTE pathways that lead to that um, credential. And so there are three different checks here and three different opportunities to demonstrate whether these students, these high school students, are ready graduates. Uh, and that is the way in which uh, the um, measure of school quality and student success required indicator will be met. So again, it had two pieces. It had the chronic absenteeism uh, metric for elementary and high school and then the uh, ready graduate indicator for high schools only. So let's talk a little bit about how an A school will be defined and some of the parameters around that. There will not, not be a cap on the, on the number of A schools uh, and that an A school rating would be based on the performance of all students and the historically underserved student groups for each of those indicators. And there's a graphic in, on the, I think it's the next slide, that will demonstrate this and I think it will be clearer at that time. And so what you will see is a weighted average uh, of the overall students and the uh, subgroups that that bring together 
uh, that come together for a single rating. Let's talk about how an F school is defined and then we will sh show you the graphic. Uh, ESSA requires that the states identify the 5% lowest performing schools and in Tennessee we will um, those will be the schools that will earn the grade of F. Uh, there is a, a hold harmless in there if a school has earned uh, an overall TVOS of four or five for two consecutive years, they will not be identified as a priority school. Again, trying to reward growth and, uh, at all levels and so indicating that you have uh, the opportunity to uh, not be identified as an F uh, if you have these high levels of growth over a two-year period. Um, so in Tennessee, all priority schools will receive the F grade uh, and that that list or that list of schools will be identified uh, once every three years as required in the ESSA law. Having said that, schools could exit priority status every year uh, and earn a higher grade uh, if that rigorous criteria are, were met. Uh, and again, we talked about that early. Uh, a school who uh, doubles its AMO in a year, for example, uh, demonstrating that higher level of growth. Uh, and again, that is capped at 5% of schools in Tennessee. So here's an example for K-8, and I, I think this graphic helps because I think you can see how on the left-hand side you see the indicators, the achievement, growth, opportunity to learn, and the English language proficiency um, achievement indicator on the left-hand side. Across the top you will see that all students, uh, as well as the historically underserved students, and the weighting across those. So uh, weighting across the top and weighting down through the indicators. Uh, looking at this K-8 school, you, can, you will see that you can earn different letter grades for those four different indicators uh, that ultimately result at the bottom of the all students grade as well as the um, uh, subgroup grade, the weighting that's associated with that for that overall school grade uh, of a B. It looks a little bit different for high school because you have on the left hand side the ready graduate indicator added uh, at the bottom, uh, at the top on the left. So the weights are adjusted slightly to accommodate that additional metric at the high school level. It works basically the same way. You have the 60-40 weighting of all students versus the historically underserved students and then the weighting of the indicators, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, down the column. You will notice that achievement and growth are equally weighted in both the K-8 example and the high school example. And then the additional indicators of opportunity to learn and the English language proficiency are uh, weighted at a, at a lesser rate. Again, it works the same way with the all students grade uh, as the subgroup score resulting in the overall school grade. So just to kind of circle back to the beginning of this school accountability model, it ensures that an unlimited number of schools could be could earn the A grade uh, and that it allows any school to earn that grade uh, through that AMO achievement indicator, uh, not just going by uh, absolute achievement. Because if you were to only base this on absolute achievement, you would it would be almost impossible for a very low performing school to ever earn uh, that grade. It does limit the number of schools that will receive the F score uh, to 5% uh, as the state's identified priority schools required in ESSA. We've had some questions as to why, why the limitation on F with no limitation on A and when we think about the requirements around those additional supports for those lowest performing schools, it takes an extensive amount of, of capacity to do that. And so rather than watering down that support over a larger percentage of schools, we feel like having this would allow us to uh, provide the necessary supports to this 5% of schools. Our hope is that they move out of the bottom 5% with those additional supports. For um, the additional highlights, uh, we know that there, um, that this type of reporting is going to highlight those equity challenges uh, and our hope is that having 
uh, not just you know what we what schools will see while there is a summative score so let's say a score overall earns a B there's additional information so that a school could click on that letter grade or or be presented almost with that screen that I just shared with you on the K-8 and the high school to actually identify areas where schools can improve where before it may have just and having if you were to just see an overall letter grade you may miss the fact that overall you, you know certain indicators you were doing quite well but it helps schools identify uh, specific areas of challenge uh, that could be uh, improved and our hope is that um, this would also incentivize districts to uh, work with those other uh, historically underserved groups of students to improve their achievement. Uh, it definitely includes multiple indicators uh, so that it's not just the overall score but the uh, underlying factors and it balances out that single letter grade versus all of those subscores that uh, contribute to that. It includes progress at every performance level so again it's not just about <clears throat> the highest level, but it's about rewarding both overall achievement and approaching um, proficiency or, and mastery. Uh, so it, it is designed to reward progress at every level in the model. Uh, it also meets the requirements of the Every Student Succeeds Act and the requirement of the state legislature for the uh, A through F grading system within this single plan. All of the work that we have done to develop this plan is to ensure that our students are successful and that our students are prepared uh, and that all students have the opportunity uh, to, to take courses uh, that are advanced or that are varied and, and finding things uh, that they are interested in pursuing. And it really is about ensuring that districts have the information, the resources, the supports that they need to make those decisions to ensure that we are successful for all of our students after graduation. Great. So I um, know I think we have about 10 minutes left. We've gotten several questions, so I'm going to try to answer as many of these as possible. Um, so we got a question about class size, particularly okay. for um, lower grades teachers. So, can you explain, you know, what, sure. if anything, ESSA may or may not say about class size, and then maybe how districts could think about approaching that? I think that's. I'm glad you actually mentioned that. We actually have a number of districts in Tennessee, uh, under No Child Left Behind, who use their Title II dollars for reduction of class size. Um, that is something that was <clears throat> was continued in uh, as an allowable use of Title II under the Every Student Succeeds Act. What the Every Student Succeeds Act also does is require um, the use of evidence-based practices and that's something that uh, if you have been using, if a district has been using its 2A dollars for class size reduction for a number of years, uh, under, the, under ESSA you may be asked to demonstrate how this has been something that has you know, re produced outcomes for students because it's an expensive intervention. Yes, it's continued to be allowable for all grades, not just lower grades, but all grades. But it is something that we will be asking, you know, how can you demonstrate that this has been effective? If it's something you've been doing for a, for a number of years, I think the other piece is that with all of these changes, uh, those Title II dollars are intended to support teacher uh, teachers. Uh, and so when you think about what that training could be, uh, we, we are really encouraging districts to take this opportunity in this new law to truly revisit what they are doing with those dollars to ensure that they're getting the biggest bang for their buck uh, as possible with, with Title II, with Title I, with the new Title IV grant as well, and not to just uh, make those quick decisions um, about how they've done it historically. That's great. Uh, another question um, that we've gotten, and we're actually um, joined here with Hillary Knudsen, who for um, a time worked with Senator Lamar Alexander, who helped lead the passing of ESSA, uh, I guess a, a little over a year ago. Um, we got a question, we get this question pretty frequently, that as the new administration comes in, what sort of changes we might um, be anticipating to happen at the federal level, and then how might that impact what happens um, here, both you know, what we have to do and what um, might what, what might changes might look like moving forward. Um, so even Hillary, if you want to maybe chime in a little bit on, on what we're thinking as we're trying to also read the tea leaves um, from our level. 
I think this is already thanks all again for joining. I I think it's important to note that Tennessee has taken a really unique approach in drafting our plan. The the active choice to not use the federally designed template but present our plan as it aligns to the Tennessee Succeed Strategic Plan provides us with this blueprint, this roadmap for continuing on the path forward. So regardless of changes to regulations or guidance that come from the new administration, we've set a clear path forward for Tennessee and through this robust stakeholder input and feedback, we know that on the whole, we're, we're, we're continuing in the right way. So we hear uh, from you all and continue to hear these are the, the parts of the plan that really resonate, these are the things we must continue, these are the things we need to look at, and, and that's not something that will change based on the administration. No, and I definitely think that as, you know, we expect that what the U.S. Department of Education uh, will look like and who will be there and maybe some of the priorities may shift, but because the Every Student Succeeds Act was a bipartisan bill uh, supported strongly and led by Senator Lamar Alexander in Tennessee and Patty Murray in the state of Washington uh, on the Democratic side of the aisle, we feel that that this has a lot of support on both sides from both parties. And so, yes, we expect that some of the players may change and even uh, the messaging, but uh, as Hillary just shared, we expect to continue moving forward with our plan and through the this feedback session, continuing to use that feedback to identify areas where, you know, in our work, we felt we felt at first that we had provided enough uh, clarity, but also identifying other areas where we may want to provide some additional context or feedback or information um, from what we have heard, uh, both in the input phase of our process and the feedback, uh, which is still ongoing. And you know, something we shared at every town hall is that. This is still a draft, and it is absolutely still a draft, and we expect feedback to continue, both from um, our external stakeholders, from the legislature, from the governor, from the state board, uh, from teachers, from uh, families. Uh, and we've had a good cross-section at our town hall meetings and are thrilled to have the opportunity to be on this call today as well to uh, solicit more feedback. So we got a question um, a little bit ago. We were talking through um, some of what we're doing for educators specifically about how um, we are approaching personalized learning in the plan, um, and specifically if it will be only for teachers who, you know, from TVOS or from whatever um, their evaluation might indicate needs some sort of additional support or what we might be providing, if, either through training or through other sorts of professional development for all teachers. Um, moving forward. Yeah, I know that we're trying to also approach this and knowing that um, that teacher evaluation gives you one set of information. I think teachers uh, ha may have a different sense of things that they would like to pursue to Im improve their practice. And so while we will continue to offer uh, trainings from the state level through our core offices, more on the regional level, uh, we expect that uh, having opportunities and and the ability to do some more personalization of learning both at the student level and and uh, at the teacher level is absolutely part of our plan. It is something that we have been kind of on the front end of, of figuring out what that looks like in terms of for teachers earning. I think there are different models out there, but really kind of offering more of, of like a, I don't want to say like a, a badge, but, but there are pieces of professional development that are, are can be kind of broken into smaller components and Tennessee is currently working to uh, provide these types of opportunities for teachers to on a on a more specific level rather than going to an all day professional development um, have an opportunity to to demonstrate their proficiency or their understanding of certain concepts and things to build their portfolio to demonstrate that they uh, have earned this um, or have this information or uh, skill in their practice. Yeah, that's great. Um, Micro-credentials. Micro that, that was the word I was you looking got there. for. Um, the next question uh, we got on is basically um, if and how we are using the stakeholder feedback. And we certainly are using the stakeholder feedback and, and you know, everything from um, how we're outlining that we're supporting English learners to how we are thinking about the yeah. weightings and the measures of the A through F system. And so if you want to talk about how, we're, how we've been thinking about it and, and maybe other areas where we're definitely getting good amount sure, of feedback. Sure, sure, absolutely. We, we know that this is such an important part of this process. This is 
while we're the ones that have been working diligently to draft this plan, this plan is the plan that belongs to this state and ensuring that we have information from our stakeholders is absolutely important. I can tell you that Hillary and I have looked at every piece of feedback that we have received. Uh, we will continue to do that and we will be, we also really push ourselves to ensure uh, to say did we do that enough? Is that clear? Let's go back and read it again and really trying to ensure that what we put out there both at the federal level for the state of Tennessee but also for the one million students that we serve across the state, a, a plan that really does meet the needs, uh, figuring out where we do need to add more detail, uh, where we do need to uh, ensure that uh, these are the right weights and running, um, looking at that information more specifically. Um, also just ensuring that, um, that we have this feedback throughout the process and not just at this juncture but even as we move into implementation because as I said earlier, the Every Student Succeeds Act, it's not perfect. I think it offers so many more opportunities than No Child Left Behind. But I know that as we move into the implementation of this new law, that we, we will probably go back and say, that didn't work exactly as we envisioned. How can we adjust it so that we can be successful, that it is supportive of our teachers, of our students uh, in the implementation phase? So I. We're using it now. We will continue to keep the, some of those feedback loops open throughout the implementation of the Every Student Succeeds Act. Great. I want to be respectful of your all's time and, and our great partners here. Um, so, Bethany, I'd love to turn this back over to you. And any questions we didn't get to, I will, um, to Sarah, I will shoot an email over to you later. Okay, and we do have a few more questions, but we'll just send those in emails, and they can see who those are from, and they can email you directly. We also have a specific ESSA. Um, as I emailed it, well, it's probably the best way to get answers, and it's essa.questions, e no, oh, essa essa feedback. sorry, my, ooh, that's mm -hmm. bad, <laughs> essa.feedback, essa.feedback at uh, tn.gov, and I think in addition to questions, it's also helpful to hear if anything was um, of particular um, strength or weakness in the plan. It's also just general feedback is helpful, too. All right, thanks so much.